So, um, yes, so today, uh, all right, so let me get the slides. Okay, so this is, uh, yep, all right, um, so last time we talked about this, um, uh, yeah, some example of Bayesian inference, and then I uploaded a video in particular to show how um, things can be done. So hopefully you get a chance to read it, and then we can um, start today's lecture. And before we start, okay, cool. Yeah, um, before we start, I have a few uh, announcements and suggestions, I think, uh, from students, and I think we will um, talk about those as well. So first of all, there is a LaTeX, uh, I sent an email to the class today, uh, there's a LaTeX workshop, intro workshop, um, this Thursday. So make sure, if you have time, make sure that you can attend. And I think you just need to bring a laptop with you and you can um, try things there. And um, the office hours for this week, I sent out an email um, already. So uh, t today I have 4.30 to 5.30 and then tomorrow I have 10 to 11 and 4 to 5 if you want to visit uh, my office hours, especially if you have questions about the homework. And um, earlier today, I um, had an online office hour with two remote students, and then one of them suggested, actually it seems to be a practice at the school, there is that in order to help people to practice using LaTeX, I'm gonna upload. So remember like for the homework, like the cover sheet, I provide in PDF, but I actually use LaTeX to do it. So in addition to the PDF of the cover page, I will also upload the LaTeX. I mean, it's not, it's not something like very complicated there, but you can start trying things because you can see how things can turn out to be, say like the mathematical notations in the PDF file. So it's a little bit weird, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, give me a second. I think the... Everybody uh, mute. I think everybody muted. So maybe I should just turn it down. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so if any of you like the remote students want to speak, maybe also like wave your hand so everybody else can see that you need to speak. Because on my and I couldn't see everybody on this. So yeah, just give me a reminder. Okay. So yeah. So later today I will upload the LaTeX file for the cover sheet as well, so you can start practicing if you want to use any of those. And uh, today, yeah, if you um, have, like after class, I will hang out for another 15 minutes if you want to um, me to help me, to help you to get the R and R Studio installed. Mm -hmm. And also, Bayan's office hours uh, is determined to be Thursday and Friday, 2 to 3.30, every Thursday and Friday. And um, as he agreed, uh, he's going to uh, like have online office hours at the same time, synchronized. So it's not, it's going to start from next week. All right, I think that's all I want to talk about before um, we start. And um, did everybody get a chance to watch the video that I posted over the break? Was the quality okay? Okay, yeah, my laptop, I don't know. When I watched it, I was, oh my God, I have to do it again. Um, but hopefully, no. And um, okay, so, oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, oh, because you guys cannot see. Grant just say yes. Okay. And um, okay, yeah, so that example, like we went really quick, I think in class, maybe too fast. And then later, I think Rachel actually asked me the question after class, like how you can actually compute um, the posterior. And then in that particular example, maybe the way that I presented was too fast and then just use R and R Studio. But in fact, for that particular example, you can do it by hand. And I think it was a good, um, I think it is a good example for you to see like how posterior computation is done for simpler situations like that. Okay, so yeah, today, um, after the probability review, we're gonna see more of those examples. And um, so yeah, always keep asking, I think, whether things that are being done in R can actually be done by hand. 
and I mean, at some point we won't do everything by hand, but at the beginning, I think it's, um, it's good um, exercise and also uh, for you to see better of how things are done and why things can be done in this way. So make sure they ask and um, have a discussion. All right, so it should be a quick probability review. I try to um, put in things that I think are important. Um, note that for this chapter, uh, for the problem, so we're gonna just do a review of probability. Once we move to the normal model later, we're gonna do some review of linear algebra as well. I assume everybody have taken that, um, but still, like there are certain like matrix um, algebra manipulation stuff that I would use extensively for those normal models in Bayesian methods. So I will make sure that we do a review of that later when we get there. But for this part, for the probability, I think it's important even just to, at the beginning of the uh, semester, um, if you can do it. Okay, so events and partitions. Okay, in particular, we like to think of partition in the Bayesian uh, situation. So for example, in the example that we saw last time about the um, say people's belief about the percentage of um, bachelor students actually going to stay up one night last semester. We I gave you a simplified version. Right, I gave you eleven choices, zero point one point two until one zero one point zero, right? And that's a petition, right? It's a petition of the sample space that I only give you eleven choice choices, and that spans the entire sample space. And then I ask the whole group, like the whole class to come up with the prior. So that's an example of partition. And, and yeah, leave it over here, you can also provide other examples later. Uh, but in particular, I want to mention that partition, especially if you think about all of the entire sample space, in the Bayesian methods, we want to either discrete or continuous, we want to enumerate all of them and then trying to make inference about all of them at the same time. So just think about the example that we saw before. But for the definition, uh, H1 until HK is a petition of another set H if, first of all, the events needs to be disjoint. So you see that the intersection of these two is an empty set, okay? They cannot happen, um, they, yeah, they, they cannot happen at the same time. And the union of the subset, uh, the union of all of the sets is the bigger set itself, okay? And you see that you can write the union, um, it's K from one to capital K, and then H subscript K to be H, okay? So just now I gave an example of um, a petition, anybody else? Just volunteer. And um, remote students, I think you can just unmute and talk as well. I think we can hear you just fine. Anyone? Petition. Yeah. They need to be disjoint and um, all of the possibilities should come up to one. I didn't figure out how to use the uh, Bluetooth headset today, so I have to walk with this a little bit if anybody wants to volunteer. What can be a petition? Eli. Uh, in the homework, one of the questions asks about the occupations of fathers and sons. Mm -hmm. That's partitioning the set of sample fathers and sample sons by occupation. So there's like farmers, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, okay. et cetera. Okay, so I think there must, yeah, so good. And I think for that example, we need to make the assumption that all of the listed occupations actually are all the ones that we can choose from, right? Because right. yeah. if you just post like the occupations, it can be anything, right? Yeah, but I think you're right. If you define your sample space, say uh, all of the possible com uh, all of the possible occupations define you define them explicitly, then you can think of them as a partition for each of the people, like fathers and sons. Okay, anything else? Anyone? The surveys that I um, like to do at the beginning of classes, I usually ask questions about, um, say, yeah, let's say like class year, for example. And then class years of freshman, um, sophomore, junior, and senior, and then other, maybe. 
all of those will be a partition of the sample space for students of our class. Okay, if you go beyond, say if you go to a research university, then if you just post a survey uh, to any students, then the choices needs to be expanded to like graduate student or even further expand to master's students, PhD students, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so that would be another example. So uh, events and petitions, make sure that you know, um, if you're looking at a petition, they need to be disjoint and the union of them is the entire space. All right, so um, we can actually write it together according to the axioms of probabilities. Okay, so the first of all is the sum of them will be one. So for the discrete case in particular, so if you have a petition H1 to HK, then the sum of K from one to K, probability of each of the event HK, sum up to be one. Okay. And something very important um, to notice, I think is the second bullet point over here, the marginal probability, because that directly gets us to the base rule later. Okay. So let's look at this one first together. The rule of marginal probability, let's say now we have a partition of h okay but now we have a different event let's say e so the probability of e will be sum of e intersecting with all of the elements of the partition that we have seen before okay so that's what this notation is about so you see that probability of e it's sum k from one to capital k and here in the probability we use the intersection sign over here E intersecting with each of the HK. Okay. And the second part of this, the last part, will it's uh, application of the joint distribution to be the product of the marginal and the conditional. Okay. So this, um, I think we have, uh, yeah, we definitely have seen it before, but I think I just want to highlight that this um, is very important. Okay, so this is trying to utilize a the joint of a and b will be either the product of marginal v times the conditional a given b or the other way around okay and you have seen that from last time that the particular and i think for the homework one and two um from a uh, question one and two you see that that is what you have um utilized before. Okay, let me get rid of that so we can have bigger space. Okay. Yeah, and this rule really is stemming from the back and forth of app of using these terms. Okay. But for this case we have particular ways of writing things. So this is another event E. Okay. All right. And then you see that the third bullet point over here, the base rule now look at the question the question is now i'm interested in this okay now i'm conditioning on e so from part two we have the margin of e so we know that if i'm trying to do the base rule so this is the posterior it will be the product uh the product the marginal and the conditional over the other marginal okay and the, argin, the other marginal for the discrete case will just be the sum of all of the cases. Okay. Yeah. So if you think about the question that we had in, cla uh, uh, in class and also in the, uh, in the small sh short video that I did before, remember we're looking at 11 options. So down here, we're doing some of 11 different joint distributions, okay? And all of them is trying to tell you probability of E intersecting with each of the HK, okay? Yeah, so um, this is just a fresh, uh, just to like brush up your skills with this manipulation of probability, conditional, uh, joint, and um, marginal. Okay. And you see that its base rule is really stemming from this. Okay, so, uh, oh, sorry, I need to. Okay. All right, so in Bayesian theorem, let's see. Earlier we we're talking about all of this hypothesis, uh, sorry, all of the disjoint and partition. So right here, 
let's think about the partition that we have as different hypotheses or like states of nature or your beliefs, okay, different choices, and make sure that you think of them as a partition because now we're exhausting all of the partition, sorry. Yeah, so now they're disjoint and we're trying, and you can think of them of different uh, hypotheses and now we're testing it. And the E, the notation E that I used before, can think of it as the outcome, and you can also think of it as the data. Okay, so here on the top, you can think of prior, and uh, in particular, it's prior on hypothesis. Okay. So suppose, for the example that we have seen last time, we're assuming that people have different beliefs about uh, the percentage of master students gonna stay up all night to do work and uh, we're giving you 11 choices and then each person can vote for one. So we come up with out of 20 people, how many you think is uh, for that particular choice. Okay, so for each choice, we're gonna put a prior probability and that's the empirical prior distribution that we come up last time. Okay, and the data over here for last time will be um, one out of 10. That will be how many people actually did that, it's 10%. Okay. So now, remember, down here, because we try to start with the prior on hypothesis, and now we're going to combine with data, and the ultimate goal is to get still our interest in the hypothesis. We're updating the probability belief about the hypothesis, and when we say posterior, that's after you see the data, you combine with the prior. Okay? So let's say now, if you look at this term, both of them are conditioning on the data. So it's conditioning on E, okay? And then we're looking at two distinct, so I is not J, okay? Two distinct hypotheses. If we do the manipulation of the um, Bayes rule, you will see that on the top, it will be the product divided by the marginal, right? And on the bottom, it's gonna be the product by the, uh, divided by the marginal as well. And you notice that the product here, each of them is associated with its own subscript. And that's the specific hypothesis they're looking at. So if you do that, sorry, uh, I need to, okay. Yeah, so we can cancel out certain terms because you're dividing both this, right? And then you can further simplify, I think. Yeah, so the further simplification over here is you break it down only looking at the part. So before this line, this is the part about the data given each hypothesis, right? And the second, oh, yeah. So if you take the prior into the person? What do you mean? Like, so one of those is the prior hypothesis, like before you look at the data. Mm -hmm. Is the other one, is the one you're comparing to the one where you just the hypothesis after using the data? Yeah, so on the right hand, on the left hand side, we're looking at, uh, yeah, we're comparing different posterior. Yeah, good point. Okay, and so this is the goal. So pretty much, okay, so start from this um, exercise over here. We're trying to ask the question, okay, now we have seen the same data, but we have two competing or multiple competing hypotheses, right? Say for example, HI and HJ, and now we want to see which one is more likely. And that's why you want to do this ratio of the probability. Yes? Um, so what is the significance of choosing to divide it other than the fact that it works out to be in the mathematics? Um, it, like if it's greater than one, the top one is more likely, is that kind of the thing? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, yeah. But not like maybe not just one, maybe certain degree, right? So, okay, so good point. So here, like you said, because we're doing this manipulation, then you can cancel out terms. So you see down here, I'm trying to break it into two parts. The first part is about the ratio of the prior, right? And the second part is about the ratio of the likelihood. So let me, yeah, let me explain it one by one. So first of all, Emma's question is why we're doing this ratio over here. And on the left-hand side, you see that we're assuming that we're looking at the same set of data, but we're looking at 
two competing claims. Over here, by the way, you have k different ones. Okay, you can compare all of them together or in some other ways. But for now, we're interested in only two and evaluate which one is more likely, given that you have seen the data. So that's what this ratio on the left-hand side mean. And then we start doing this base rule for all of both top and the bottom. And we realized that, as Eli said, we can cancel out things. And then in the end, we came up with two distinct parts over here. So the first part, we call it base factor. Okay? And what this means, each of this term over here, this is if the hypothesis I is true, the probability that you're going to see the data. Right, because this is E, probability of E given the hypothesis. Okay, and then that's on the top. And on the bottom is very similar. And now you're giving a different hypothesis here. Okay, so each of this part is about the probability that you see the data given that the hypothesis is true. Okay, yeah. And we call it base factor. And let me just like, stop with this at the moment. And let me explain about the prior belief a little bit more over here. So on the second part over here, is the ratio of the prior of the two competing claims that you have. Okay? So this, this manipulation is, in the end, you will see that it's telling you how your decision in the end, if you're looking at this prior, uh, sorry, this ratio on the right hand side, on the left hand side, you can be broken down into the base factor, which is telling you the, like, the ratio of the likelihood of the data given different hypotheses times the prior beliefs that before you start doing anything. Okay? So I should say, so to be honest, I think a lot of people, so this is a lot of times for a pedagogy point of view that, okay, you see, you can break it down and it makes sense because the ratio of the posterior should just be the product, the ratio of the prior and the product, uh, sorry, let me slow it down. Uh, the ratio of the posterior of two competing claims should just be the product of the ratio of the prior and the ratio of the likelihood, okay? And it makes sense because for each of the parts, it is what we know from the Bayes rule. And in particular, people like to call this like the ratio of the prior beliefs. And then in particular, for this part, they like to call it base factor. Okay? <coughs> so to be honest, I think um, my experience and knowledge about this is pretty much just, okay, I know what this is called. But in, in practice, how much we use it, um, I think there are definitely like research out there doing it. But for, for our class, I don't think we're gonna do much about it but still i think it's um a good exercise for you as well to see how they can be broken down yeah because they're not the prior right that's something else like what what would an example of it and a hypothesis in okay situation? good point okay so what would be the hypothesis so let me erase what i have um written down so far and let's go to the question of um, what would be the hypothesis? This is a great example because I think a lot of things are going on. So let's just go back to the example that we had. Say, um, mm, the probability of people who actually, um, so in that case, the probability of, of ASA students who are actually gonna stay up one night, okay? So back then, we have 11 choices. And I don't remember exactly, but I think part of the probability was like, let's just say this is what we had, okay? Or let's say zero, okay? So this is the values of theta, and this is the probability associated with it, okay? So can anyone tell me, in this case, what is, say, the disjoint hypothesis? And what are the priors? Yes, Katie. Uh, the hypotheses are the 
like guesses that we volunteered in class for different values of theta. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, are the priors the probabilities of those respective guesses? Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, so for this case, for the example that we talked about in class in the short video, we're interested in the true proportion of, um, yeah, true proportion of students stay up for one night for doing uh, their work. And the competing claims back then, because we make, we discretized it just to make things easier. Because if you're looking at probability, it can go from zero to one can be anything, right? But in class, we simplify it to be 11 different choices, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 until one. And then all of this, the 11 of them, they come up as a partition, right? Because all of them are possibilities of the probability, and then they are disjoint, right? And the union of them is the entire sample space, as I only define the 11 options out there. So those are, so say, this will be my one, this will be my h1, h2, h3, until hk, right? Yeah, for that particular example. And then we know that the probability associated with it as the prior that we came up with will be, uh, say, for 0 is 0, for 1 is 25%, for 3, uh, for 2 is point, uh, point 0.2 is 25%. So each of this is a probability of that right so these are the priors okay so i think this is a great great question i think maybe i yeah i was too familiar with all of this so i just started writing things but there are the differences um just one more quick thing sure. data figuring all of this like when we start sort of data that we have one person mm -hmm. good point so if you watch the video you probably would know Oh, oh, okay, good, good, yeah, okay. So the data over here for that particular example was, we have one person saying that they were answering the question, okay? Yeah, so for example here, so here, look, this is H1, associate prior, H2, associate prior, sorry about the writing over here, and then for all of them, associate with, 11 over here okay and then we combine the data and the way that we combine the data for this particular example in class was slightly um i think it was interesting because okay so say if we're looking at this particular choice so this will be the value and we know that the prior probability that we put up for this the prior probability that we put for this Mm, okay, was 25%, right? Say so this is what we have, okay? And then what we did for, um, if you look at, so maybe not in this, in this particular manipulation, but what we did back then is, this is the value that you have, this is the prior, and then we assume that data given P, or theta, sorry, let me use theta so it's easier, theta over here follows the binomial distribution. So that's a fundamental assumption here, okay? And I think you really asked a good question over here. So, okay, so this is the prior that we came up with, right? And then they're discrete, and we came out as a whole group. But the key point for that particular example is that we made the fundamental assumption that the number of yes that we're gonna get follows a binomial distribution. Meaning that, okay, this is my theta. And it's binomial because I'm looking at the number of people who are going to say yes. And I asked M person that question. Okay? So if I assume that everybody's having the same probability of doing that, and everybody is independent from each other, this will be a binomial model. Right? So binomial, if that is the case, then Y given theta will be binomial, and you know that the probability of Y given theta will be N choose Y, theta raised to the power of y, and one minus theta raised to the power of n minus y. Right? And then in the video you, you have seen, or you will see, uh, we, I further like, just um, put in the numbers that we know, because like, we know n is 10, y is 1, and then for different theta, you can come up with different values for that. 
and that will be the likelihood that you have. So that's how all of the pieces come up together. Okay, no problem. I think that's a great question. So you see that, so for, okay, so that is um, some um, flashback of the examples that we did, but really in this particular side, a slide that I'm doing right now is looking at, okay, so instead of looking at just one of them, say point one, how about I want to compare point one, given the data, over point two, okay? Say, if I'm interested in comparing the posterior probability of the hypothesis of actually is one, point one or point two, then this will be the manipulation I can do, and that boils down into the ratio of the prior, and then the ratio of the likelihood. Make sense? Yeah, so I think a lot of times people like to do this ratio thing. First of all, you need to be able to list all of the possibilities. So it's usually in the discrete case, okay? And second of all, remember for the Bayes rule that we had before, if you're just doing a generic this, what you have? You have the prior multiplies with the likelihood and then divided by the data, right? The marginal probability of the data. And what we did is, you know, if you can list all of the possibilities, like in class, what we did before, and in the video, you know that you can sum up. I, let's do K from one to, uh, I forgot, 11. And then H, K, P, B. So if you imagine, like, so in the video, um, you, I didn't, like, really do everything by hand because I said that you can simplify things and then you can just fit in an R and then they can do the computation for you, right? So if you want to do like a full analysis just for a particular hypothesis, this is what you're gonna do. If it's discrete, you sum them up. If it's continuous, you integrate them out, right? However, sometimes if I only care about, I think, say for example, I think back then in the classroom, maybe most people choose between point one and point two. Okay, so how about this? I don't care about all of the other options. Let me just focus on this two, and then taking the ratio of the posterior will be a quicker way in some sense. Okay, so yeah, so this actually posed a, like a good point over here because you know, a lot of times the marginal probability of the data is very hard to compute. And that's mostly what the challenges are. Okay, so say for example, like the base factor approach over here is simplifying things because I only need to care a couple of them or a pair of them or multiple pairs of them. But if you want to, like in the formal thing, I think if you do, you really need to figure out how you can compute that particular marginal over here. And that can be tedious and sometimes impossible. Tedious case will be what we saw in the video that I showed you. You can actually do because you only have 11 choices and you can do all of them. But then maybe sometimes you have more, and sometimes it's a, a, a like integral that is analytically impossible, things like that. Okay, but I think yeah, but I think those questions you guys asked were really good because I think that helped me to break it down into pieces and then show um, show the steps. Okay, all right. So uh, anything else? Yeah. So for the remote students. Uh, FYI, because in order to have more space that I can write, I actually um, put into smaller windows of all of your cameras. So if you actually have questions, maybe you can uh, even either just like unmute and then speak out or uh, send me or like to send a note uh, to the class and then I can, I can actually see it on the iPad that you have a question. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. So, all right. So I think that's um, what we have. Okay. So. Lastly, down here, I put a comment. Bayes' rule does not determine what our beliefs should be after seeing the data. It tells us how they should change after seeing the data. Okay. So from this particular breakdown of uh, the ratio of the posterior, I hope you also um, see that. Okay. All right, so, okay. So here, I will actually go um, pretty quickly because uh, those are uh, the real, I think, like probably the review over here, um, break it down into discrete continuous variable, discrete, var 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 sorry, univariate, univariate random variables among them, 
we know about the discrete and continuous. For the discrete, we like to say, okay, it's just summation, it's just point mass, et cetera, et cetera. For the continuous, will be integration or uh, differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. So I just provide the list over here. I think from probability course, you know all of this. So don't worry, like writing down notes over here, you have access to all of this. But in general, um, yeah, for the discrete case, uh, for the PMF, point mass function, it's at that point, the probability associated with it. However, for the continuous, uh, which I think was, um, should be like difficult for a lot of people at the beginning, uh, because for the continuous case, how we define the probability density function is really starting from the cumulative first. Okay, we cumulated for, so on the top, you see the cumulative distribution function for any x, both discrete or continuous, is the probability that x is smaller or equal to the particular point that you're looking at. Okay, so once you know that, if you take, um, uh, say, for the density function over here for a continuous case, you are taking the um, derivative of that. Okay, and then for PDF, the uh, definition will be uh, if you're looking at x in a particular range or particular region, then it will be integration of that, okay? So just a quick review and then discrete, uh, well-defined sum up to, all of the probably sum up to one, continuous integration into one, and CDF here is summation as well. And then for the uh, CDF for the continuous will be integration. And this one is very important. Mm -hmm. And expectation uh, for the discrete, uh, for x itself will be sum of all possible x multiplied with density, okay? And then for a function of x, gx, then it's the same, very similar, I should say, fx multiplies with the function itself. And then for the continuous random variables, expectation will be a integration of x, fx. And then expectation of a function will be um, integration of gx, fx. Okay, so this um, should be Familiar, so this is a quick review over here. And um, join distribution, I put them down over here as well. Uh, especially, I think it's important to um, think about like, those terms and those terms over here. Yeah, so this is a review, and later we're gonna see a little bit more of this as well. Especially, I think this is related to the third question in the homework. That's how you actually gonna do multiple rounds of manipulation of the joint to be the product of the conditional and the marginal, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so this is the basic. I mean, so for example, for the discrete, if you know the joint of X and Y, in order to get the marginal of X, you're summing out of all of the Y, okay? And for Y as well, you do it vice versa. And then for a continuous case, you're just integrating out, okay? So if you have the joint of X and Y, the joint density is F, X, Y, if you integrate out y, then you will get the margin of x, okay? And the same for, for y. Mm -hmm. And I think those are um, important to note uh, at the beginning so you know what we're mm, doing later. Great. So joint distribution. And okay, so this is the part that I was talking about. So for the conditional distribution, it will be, so let me bring this view out together. Yeah, for the continuous distribution, it will be, uh, say, x given y. So formally, we like to write this subscript to, sh to tell what is the density that we care about. A lot of times you can, you can like um, get rid of that, that's fine as well. But overall, over here, I like to make the distinction that say f subscript y, y will be um, the density of y, the marginal density of y. Okay? So x given y will be the joint of x and y over the marginal of y. So you will see this term. And you see that we do it different ways, and that's how Bayes' theorem is done. And also, I just quote uh, the useful results that I put um, on the cover sheet of the homework one over here, because back then, I think that question is asking you to show whether things are conditionally independent, okay? So there are certain things useful, for example, because I think they're talking about X, Y, Z, okay? And then if you're gonna have, in order to get the joint of Y and Z, and you have the joint of x, y, z, you just need to integrate out x, okay? So this is a three variable case, extension of the two variable case that we have seen before, okay? And also, if you want to get the margin of one out of the joint of the three, you just do double integral, okay? So here, I write it generically as the integral, but of course, if you have um, 
discrete case, you can write a summation. Okay. But I think a lot of times people just use uh, the integral to represent for all of the cases because people usually understand what it is. Okay. Right. So there's that. And then two other um, things that you should have learned before, conditional expectation and conditional variance is using, say, for the conditional expectation is using the law of total expectation. That's just sometimes a quicker way for you to get an answer. Okay, so this just uh, like give you some um, fresh up of the memory. And then for the conditional variance is using uh, a similar idea, but now the variance of X will be a sum of two uh, parts, the expectation of the conditional variance and the variance of the conditional expectation. So, so for example, like uh, for a homework one, I, I think for question three, uh, the hints that I provided like down here, as well as on the cover sheet, they're the same, um, should be sufficient. Okay, so in the future, say if there are other exercises, if there are certain things that I think it's useful and then useful to remind you, then I will just put a note over there. So, so far, say uh, for homework one, I think you're good to go with, uh, with those. Uh, with those things, yeah. But I put the conditional expectation variance here just in case later we're gonna use them. Okay. All right, so this is uh, that. And okay, another thing I want to uh, do a quick exercise, um, I'm actually gonna ask you to try it, is to do transformation of variables. That's also an important topic. Um, I think and we will use it later as well. So suppose, um, X is a continuous random variable and FX is its PDF. And now if I'm looking at a function of X, GX, you, if you want to do transformation, you need to check two conditions. You need to first make sure that it's monotonic. The function GX is monotonic and it's also differentiable. Then you can actually use this formula to come up with the PDF of Y. Okay? So this can be very important and useful later as well. And I think in the probability class, you have seen that um, before, okay? So uh, formally, um, it is done in this way, but let's focus on this particular um, form, okay? So this is saying that if GX is monotonic and differentiable, and if you know that FX, you know what FX is, the PDF of X and X is continuous, then you can do transformation of variables to get the PDF of Y, okay? So it's gonna be the PDF of X multiplies with the absolute value of DX over DY, okay? So let's keep things in mind and just do a quick exercise before we um, move to the next. So let X to be a uniform, continuous uniform between zero and one, okay? And I ask you what distribution does Y equals to negative natural log of x half, okay? So I put down the hint uh, here from the previous slide. You need to make sure that negative log x is monotonic and differentiable, and then you can use this particular formula that we just covered, okay? So I'll give you a few minutes to, um, to do this, and then we're gonna look at it together. Yeah, if you don't, you can calculate it.
feel free to talk to your neighbors. And I know for remote students, it might be a little bit harder, but um, yeah, we will figure out something later, I think, how to make that work. So we need to check if it's monotonic and differentiable, and then figure out how to get dx over dy. I just started with the a few lines of scratch at the beginning. So formally we call it inverse function, right? Like you know x, uh, y is in terms of x, right? And then um, you need to come up with the inverse function, try to write x in terms of y, and they will be able to get dx over dy. Okay? So if we know that y is negative log of x, then natural log, then x will be the x function with negative y. And then um, dx over dy will just be uh, taking a derivative of that particular function. Okay. Right. So with that, I think um, it will be easier um, to do. So let me just show you how I prepare. So first of all, um, you should check if it's monotonic and differentiable. It is the negative natural log. It is monotonic and differentiable, so you're good to go. And let me do it. Okay. And then the inverse function, you're gonna be able to write what x in terms of y. So for dx over dy will be negative e to the negative y. And then in the end, uh, so first of all, you know that the range of y um, is from zero to infinity. Then using the formula that we know, fx, fy is fx multiplies with the absolute value of dx over dy, which will be e to the negative y. Okay. And with that, you know that, oh, I don't know if you remember about the exponential distribution, but um, this will be the exponential distribution of one. Okay. But for now, I think as long as you can come up until this part, we're good. Okay. Any questions? If not, let's just go to the last few slides of the review over here. Um, so here, we, I think you know about independent variables, uh, independent random variables, but in here, I want to particularly put it into this conditional independent, conditional independent form. Because in Bayes' theorem, or in Bayes' methods, theta is the parameter that we're interested in, okay? And y, say y 
given theta generically is just how given the parameter what is the distribution of y okay so for the example that we have seen before we saw the binomial model of the case okay so we really like to talk about uh, conditionally independent for for theta given all of the y over here because that's what we have seen that we will be seeing a lot in the uh, bayesian method so let me just define it suppose y1 to yn are random variables and theta is just a parameter describing the conditions okay under which the general other uh, we can generate the random variables so we say y1 to yn they're conditionally independent given theta if you have that given theta the joint distribution of y1 belongs to a n a1 sorry y2 belongs to a2 and yn belongs to an you can factor them out to the product of all of the marginal over here okay so particularly we're given um theta so we call them conditionally independent given theta okay this is one thing and um so under independent you will see that we will use this a lot as well in order so in frequentist method you have taken uh, mathematical statistics that kind of course you know that if they're iid then we like to write the joint as the product of the marginal right however here because we're defining everything given theta so you're going to be given theta everywhere okay so we will use this um pretty often i think in bayesian method as well so it would be good um to review at the moment and then lastly um we so in the case that i just described we say that y1 to yn they are conditionally independent and identically distributed so it's conditionally iid if you can write uh, sorry about yeah next time i will try to break it into a different slides because i think it's not being recorded uh but hopefully you can still see most of it down here uh we're gonna write y1 to yn given theta and then tilde on top of it iid and then is probability of y given theta Right. And last thing, we usually do not refer to this very often, but I think it's still important to raise it up at the beginning, is if you write, if we write probability y1 to ym to be the joint distribution of y1 to yn, and we also, okay, so here we're talking about the exchangeability idea, meaning that the order of the data arising doesn't matter. Okay, so because usually we're gonna get a set of data, say y1 to yn, okay? And now I'm using pi1 to pi n to be the permutation of the indices one to n, okay? So if you have the joint distribution of y1 to yn to be equal to, no matter what kind of permutation of the indices that you have, if they're the same, then we call all of those observations exchangeable, meaning that so for example, uh, if I collect data, I, I, ask, I ask person A first, and then I ask person B, and then I collect the data, I put it together. It wouldn't matter if I ask person B first and then person A later, okay? So this is, um, I mean, it's, it's a fundamental assumption that people will be using in Bayesian um, inference, and later you actually don't see that often, but I still want to raise it up at the beginning that a lot of times when we're writing things, IID, et cetera, et cetera, we're making the assumption that they're exchangeable, okay? The order of the data collected doesn't matter. Or even in the same sample, the order of the questions that you're asking people doesn't matter, okay? And then from there, we have the Definiti, Dinetti, sorry, Definetti theorem. So if Y1 to Yn be a sequence of random variables, and then if they're exchangeable, then, and there exists a prior, let me write it over here, for the parameter that describes how the data is generated, you will have the joint by integrating out the prior, uh, sorry, the parameter over here. Okay. Okay. So the step that I didn't put in here will be, if usually you have y1, yn, given this, right? And then if you do the joint, if you integrate out, this will be 
the left hand side, right? And we just write it together um, on the final product over here because if you have them exchangeable and IID, then that's what you can do. Okay. All right, I think, yeah, I think that's pretty much um, all that I have for this particular review. And it, yeah, takes longer um, than I planned, but hopefully gives you um, the general idea of what you need to know before you move to um, the next chapter. Okay. And I think some of this should be helpful for um, doing the homework one, especially um, question three. And for question four, uh, I know some of you might not know much about R. So, um, so for those of you who want help to download and install things, uh, just stay after class. Uh, but also for that particular question, I wouldn't like give out the entire answer, but I think I will make a short video just to describe in R how you can generate random variables, et cetera, et cetera. So hopefully that can be helpful. And for those of you who still have questions, of course, you should um, come to office hours and um, ask me, and then I can provide uh, more specific help. Okay. So this is the, um, yeah, so we still have some time. So let me um, just bring this, the second lecture out and we can have the introduction at the beginning, okay? So, so far, okay, so the second part, like the second section of this class is for one parameter models, okay? So one parameter, if you look at it, you realize that, so we've been using theta as the parameter, like it's just a generic way to write the parameter. And now for this chapter, we're gonna talk about the binomial model in detail. So in the example, we have seen how that can be done, right? But I want to use this idea. So first of all, the binomial model, if you think about it, it's n theta, right? If you fix n, if you know how many trials you're doing, the only parameter that is unknown is theta. So for the binomial model, there's only one parameter, okay? So that's why binomial model falls into this one parameter models. And we're gonna start from one parameter models because they're simpler, okay? You only have one parameter, one thing that is random. And only one parameter for the binomial is the success probability because knowing that can determine the entire distribution. Okay, so we're gonna start from that. So for this, I will um, first give an example like application of how you can do the parameter model, uh, one parameter model using the binomial. And then we're gonna use that to introduce um, a distribution called theta distribution. And from there, we'll be able to learn about, I don't know if you have heard the term conjugate prior before, conjugate prior and posterior. So beta and binomial, they're actually, a, I guess, good friends because they can be very easily done in analytic form. Okay, so that would help us to understand what is conjugate prior, um, and then from there, we can see some other aspects of Bayesian inference just using this particular um, example. Okay, so let me just have a 15 minutes intro uh, into this and then we're gonna end. Okay, so the binomial model, the example that I want to give. So last time, uh, the example that we had uh, was looking at the probability of people um, gonna put an on onider last semester. And then we put a binomial model there because it also makes sense, okay? So here, uh, let me introduce you the context and then let's look at a binomial model for this. So in 1988, no, 1998, the New York Times and CBS News pulled 1048 randomly selected 13 to 17 years old to ask them if they had a television in their room. So this is, was 20 years ago. So the sample size is 1048. And the data that we got out of the 1,048 uh, uh, kids, 692 of them reported that they have a television in their room, okay? So now the interest, we just want to see the percentage or the proportion of that age group who actually had a television in their room back in 1998, okay? So what would be a reasonable probability model for the data? I kind of put it down in the binomial model, so you probably guessed it. But uh, maybe let's just uh, do a quick, um, quick discussion of whether binomial is actually a good model for this. So what is binomial? You have n trial, and you have a fixed probability of success, and the observation, the outcome, the random variable itself is the number of successes that you get. Okay, so in this case, 
it's y given n and theta will be a binomial you do that so do you remember the assumptions that people make when they assume that things follow a binomial distribution i kind of talked about it earlier in class just now because i was trying to describe what we looked at last time but let's just pause and think about it again because anyway so for this example we're going to use the binomial model but still it's always important to think about whether it is a good assumption here, whether the binomial model will be good enough over here. Okay. So I think there are four, like back in 241, when I taught it, I think we like to talk about four conditions of a binomial distribution. What are they? I can write the form for you if um, that would be. Uh, let's see, theta, theta is the success probability, and then choose, let's just do choose k, and then theta is to power k, 1 minus theta, What are the assumptions that we make if we're trying to assume that this is a binomial? <laughs> Just one by one, yeah. Yes, one of them is only two possible outcomes, right? So for this case, generically we like to say success and failure. For this case, is success will be they have a television. Failure is they don't, right? So for binomial, so binomial, first of all, is a bunch of Bernoulli. Bernoulli is zero, one, binary outcome. Okay, so first of all, all of this needs to be binary outcome, and we define, so in this case, let's define television, having television to be a success and not having it to be a failure. Okay, what else? Yes, Tony? Sorry? Independent observation. Yes, independent observation. So for all of this 1,084 teenagers, uh, we need to assume that they're independent from each other. In particular, whether they have a television or not, this event is independent from each other. Okay, okay that's one. Yes? Yeah, you need to assume that they all have the same success probability. Okay, and in this case, it makes perfect sense because we're trying to make the inference about this data, right? We're trying to say that, okay, the proportion of teenagers having a television is data. So it makes sense that this assumption is actually satisfied in the sense that you're trying to make inference about it. And what about the last one? Last one is kind of hidden, so maybe I will just tell you. Uh, it's the fixed number of trials that you're doing. So you need to have n to be fixed. Okay, so which makes total, in this case, it makes sense because you have a fixed number, like a fixed uh, samples that you have. And also over here, um, if you just think about the binomial, just uh, um, refresh over here as well. For binomial, earlier I was saying that n is fixed theta is the only thing that is random, and that's why it is a one-parameter model to start with. Okay? Yeah, sounds good. So out of all of these, so like say um, um, binary outcomes, of course, this one is satisfied, the total number is fixed, this one is satisfied. Do you think we can make the assumption that they're independent from each other? And then also the last one, do you think they all actually have the same probability of having a television at home? The last one is even less stable, right? Like less sounding, yeah. And the third one, um, the number, uh, yeah, the last one is it may be like different socioeconomical levels, et cetera, groups you might have different. And then, um, yeah, so that one at least might be a little bit um, not very uh, reasonable, but still, uh, we're going to use the binomial model as a pedagogy um, approach to explain the one parameter model, but I just want to take the chance here to refresh and then make sure that we all know when we are putting a model on the data set, there are so many options, uh, like there are so many assumptions that you're making, you need to be careful about those. Okay, so for this very simple example, it's a binomial, it's so straightforward, but even binomial has four conditions, and maybe some of them are not satisfied in this situation okay all right sounds good so uh, this is just the intro of the data set and okay binomial independent Bernoulli trials and then um, success probability over here um, we have seen this before okay 
And um, this is, by the way, this is success probability. This is for each trial. So this is still Bernoulli, okay? And then the last one over here, once you define the number of success, then you have a binomial distribution over here. Okay? So formally, that's what you're gonna write, the PMF, probability mass function, uh, for the Bernoulli, uh, sorry, for the binomial. And notice that the range of the Y can take from zero to N, and they're all integers, because that's the number of success that you can get. You can, you can go down to zero, because you can have zero success, and you can, at most, to be N, because you cannot get more success than the number of trials that you do, okay? So some uh, in, important features, expectation of a binomial um, random variable would just be the number of trials times the success probability, okay? Which intuitively makes sense as well. Variance may be less intuitive, but still like to make sure that we know the variance of a random variable, of a binomial random, binomial random variable is n times theta times one minus theta, okay? And for R, uh, these four functions are pretty useful. Density, probability, quantile, and then run and draw. Okay, let me actually write this down. Density, I think this is percentile. Oh, not percentile, sorry, probability. Quantile. and run and draw. So this D by norm, if you um, play with the R code that I posted before, you notice that I used this D by norm to get the likelihood, okay? Because D by norm is evaluating the density of a particular theta that you have, and then the particular data that you have, okay? Yeah, all right. So uh, this is that, and um, okay, so let's just do, it's only five minutes left, but let me just quickly do um, Bayes' rule. So for example, how we can do this for a binomial model, but right now I think it's still very generic. So conditioning on the observed outcome Y, and also here I write NN, it's still like conditioning on the total number of trials anyway. So this is Bayes' rule, we know that, okay. And down here, we know the marginal of the data, marginal likelihood of the data PY is the joint of Y and theta, but we can further break it down and then integrating out theta. Notice here, before we write negative infinity to positive infinity for any generic case, right? But here, theta is the success probability. So you're integrating from zero to one, okay? So this is that. And uh, it's the marginal density. So here, for example, if you just look at the form, you will notice that this will be some of the part of the task that we need to do in order to do a um, in order to do a Bayesian inference over here. Okay. But this one, unlike so in the um, on either example, we have a discrete case. We have eleven options, and we can sum them up easily, right? I mean, not easily, still tedious, but you can do it. Over here now is integration, okay? It's less obvious, and then maybe some of the cases is harder to do than the other. So let's keep this in mind. This will be the marginal density of the data, and that will be something that we have to deal with later. Okay. I write it down over here because this is uh, what we're going to use mostly before we dig into the math. So now, just believe me that a lot of times, especially later, we're going to see the beta binomial model you don't need to worry too much about the particular marginal, okay? So the marginal is hard to compute. Marginal is down here, okay? But remember, in Bayesian methods, we assume that theta parameter is random, but the data is fixed, okay? So the marginal density of data is known. It's just we don't know what it is, okay? In the Bayesian framework itself. Okay, let me slow down. In the intro slides um, last time, we talked about the difference between frequentist thinking and Bayesian thinking, okay? So let me just emphasize the Bayesian way again. The Bayesian way, we're still, in whichever way, we're interested in making inference about theta, okay? 
about this unknown parameter, okay? And in Bayesian, we think this is random, and we put a prior probability distribution about it because we want to like learn about this, okay? So when you think about theta is random, we actually assume that the data is fixed, okay? So let me just convince you, just try to believe me at the moment, that because of this rationale, the marginal density of the data is known, okay? Because the data is fixed, but we don't know what it is, okay? So for now, let's, let's have that belief. And then because if we know what it is, if we don't know what it is, but we know that it, it exists and is there, we can, instead of writing an equation and then they divide it by the marginal density of the data, we can write proportional, okay? So now the posterior theta given y is proportional to the product of the prior and the likelihood. Okay, so this is, for now, that's what we're gonna believe, okay? And you see that this greatly simplifies things, right? Because like I said earlier, the most difficult part in a lot of cases is how to compute this marginal density of data, okay? And for now, for this um, demonstration, we um, won't worry about it now, what PY is, but we assume that it exists and it's, we're just gonna treat it as a normalizing constant that in the end, we're dividing by PY, so we are sure that the posterior density is still like a correct density, integrates to one, okay? So this is the assumption that we're gonna make now. So on um, uh, Monday, when we come back, I will give you the example of how to do a Bayesian inference um, for this particular data set, and then we're gonna introduce the beta distribution and then I will go back to cancel what I just said, that we won't use the proportional here. We're gonna look at it and try to derive if you have a beta distribution for theta, you're actually gonna have a beta later as well, mathematically, okay? All right, so, um, okay, so I will stay here. Whoever has uh, questions about um, homework, et cetera, that's welcome as well, but for now, mostly I would like to help whoever needs help with R by downloading things and make sure that you have it running on your laptop so you can start doing homework, okay?